continuation of our webinar series, Global Politics in Critical Perspectives, Transatlantic Dialogues. I uh, would like to welcome you today from Victoria. I'm the director of the Center for Global Studies, and I have the pleasure of leading for our session on the rise of the extreme right today. Before we go into our webinar, let me make two acknowledgments. First of all, I would like to acknowledge with respect the Likwangan speaking people on whose traditional unceded territory the University of Victoria sits and where we have our webinar and the Songhees, Esquimalt uh, and Basanish peoples uh, whose historical relationship with the land here at the University of Victoria continues to this day. Um, and um, I would also like uh, to acknowledge that this webinar series wouldn't be possible without the generous support of the European Union at the Erasmus Plus um, program and the support of the Center for Global Studies here at the University of Victoria. Today we're going to look into probably one of the most troubling phenomena in contemporary political life, but also pro arguably one of the most serious threats to democracy that we face, which is the rise of the extreme right um, in contemporary politics. When we start speaking about the contemporary right, that we immediately face a problem. Whom do we subsume under the, this category? We have, on the one hand, the extreme um, neo-Nazi right you know, that often operates out of eye and out of sight of the public in very particular um, contexts, with a great degree also of propensity for violence. And then we have the parties that have run often very successfully in elections and that have gradually made their way into the political mainstream. If you think about the European context, certain parties have been around for decades now. Um, the think about the Front National or Rassemblement, Rassemblement National, um, as it is called now, um, they've gradually become part, in a way, of the political establishment al almost, governing at the local and regional level um, and being very successful even in presidential elections. Um, think about the uh, Freedom Party, the so-called Freedom Party in Austria that is now even in government, the Lega Nord, or the Lega as they're called now in Italy, being part of a populist government. Or about, you know, think about new actors such as the Alternative for Germany that for the first time um, provided um, the space for the radical right in German parliament since the Second World War. The, the gradual um, if you want to call it this way, normalization of those right-wing parties um, is, I think, is a gradual process, but one that has really changed the political landscape, in particular in the European context. What has been in place, or what was in place until recently, was a kind of a post-war consensus, uh, banning those right-wing uh, groups under the banner of a kind of a um, anti-fascist consensus from representation or from political power. That consensus seems to be eroding now. And it has to do with the very attempt of those right-wing parties to gain more legitimacy, gain more acceptability in day-to-day -day contemporary politics. And they do this, and that will be part of our discussion today, by toning down the openly racist attitudes and adopting um, a kind of political rhetoric that is compatible uh, with often more conservative positions or, or those positions that are considered legitimacy in legitimate in the public arena. So what we try to do today is to address a couple of questions that look at how far reaching the threat of the radical right is. Do they have they reached a point where we can think and speak of a genuine threat to democratic civil life um, in Western democracies. Um, what is the sociopolitical context that has allowed them to become so successful? And what modes of political mobilization have they used to launch their, uh, their campaigns and to make themselves acceptable and uh, electable to an increasing part of the population? I'm, I'm very delighted to have to, uh, to very uh, very preeminent scholars on the uh, radical right here with me from the University of Victoria. Um, Helga Agrimsdottir, I'm from uh, the, the Department or the School of Public Administration 
and Edward Hodge. Um, I'm going to introduce them more fully in a second here. We're going to start with Helga Hagenstadt here, um, looking more at the, you want to call them, the mainstream right, and then Edwin Hodge will take over and lead us into the Canadian context and look into the more radical uh, aspects of uh, this political formation. Um, let me take a second um, to introduce um, Helga, um, who is a professor of the School of Public Administration um, and also a senior researcher with the Borders and Globalization Project here at the Center for Global Studies. Um, Helga, at the same time, is also the current president of the University of the uh, Faculty Association, thus a very busy woman, and so thank you very much for taking the time given the ongoing negotiations here at our university. Um, Helga has also, you know, is a post political sociologist uh, with an emphasis on historic perspectives and comparative methods, looking at issues of government citizenship, uh, citizen participation, social movement, and contentious politics. And given our uh, topic of today, right-wing mobilization and the rise of the extreme right, you can see how this falls into the field of contentious politics. Um, and um, Halligan, you will see this from her presentation, has worked on the transformation of the political landscape in Europe since the financial crisis in 2008, 08, and 9, um, and uh, the, the rise of Euroscepticism that is often fueling the right-wing mobilization. Before I hand it over to Helga, um, let me, the uh, participants, rem let me remind you that um, at the end of the two presentations, which will be for about 15 minutes, we're going to move in a chat box into the screen where you will have the opportunity to leave your comments and questions. Um, there, there won't be an opportunity for you to engage by audio, but only in a written format. So we will do this at the end of the two presentations. Um, at this point, I will mute my mic and ask um, Helga to take the virtual podium here at, at our webinar and uh, start her presentation. Helga? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver. And. Um, um, thanks for that um, introduction. Um, will my will my uh, presentation come up on the screen? Or I just perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Let me just um, before I start, um, I'm just going to say a couple of things about um, I can't. I guess it's the context um, around which to that my remarks are flowing from, and how I see my presentation fit in with what Edwin will talk about later. So um, Edwin is going to do a much more sort of um, detailed dig into how right-wing movements are mobilizing. Um, my interest, uh, both for this talk and I think more sort of writ large, is thinking, um, I think about some general questions around what's happening um, today in terms of the state of democracy, um, how particular social and political and economic events are reshaping, um, limiting, truncating, or, cha or changing opportunities for citizen participation, um, creating new forms of mobilization and new forms of contentious politics. Um, my interest in, in the European project, and so why I titled this, this slide or this presentation, Pirate Activism in the European Project, is that um, I'm really interested in looking at how recent changes in the political landscape are forming challenges to the idea of Europe. And I just want to say a couple of things about what I mean about that, because it's not, I'm not really thinking so much about Europe as a cultural phenomenon. It's, um, it's specifically about the European project as an exercise in multilateral democracy, as Oliver talked about, as an extra exercise in post-war peace building. Uh, but in particular as an exercise in the expansion of civic, social, and political citizenship. And I think that was one of the great, um, the great transformations of, um, of the social and economic landscape in Europe um, with, the, with the, the formation of the European Union was that we engaged in this conversation writ large about different ways of belonging, different sets of rights, and frankly, an expansion of rights. Um, the, idea of rights in the European Union context doesn't just mean um, rights to vote, rights to participate, rights to mobility. 
Um, but given that the European Union is far ahead of us, uh, far ahead of North America in sustainability exercise, sustainability politics, um, social and civic and political citizenship in Europe um, also potentially involves rights to a sustainable future. So the European project, I think, is a, is a really important one to look at. And, and for that same reason, I think it behooves us to think very carefully about what kinds of challenges are being um, posed to the European project. Um, I think the, the way that I'd like to sum up everything that I'm going to say is that as we think about the far right, and um, we need to stop thinking about the challenges to democracy uh, being posed to the European Union and also to North America as simply emanating from fringe movements, because the challenges are actually much deeper. And one th and in particular, those challenges stem from the way in which we've responded to the far right. So I think that um, that's kind of the overall envelope here of what I'd like to talk about. Um, there are lots of there are lots of different um, causes for the resurgence of right wing activism. I think that there are some obvious ones, and there are some not so obvious ones, and there are links that we make that actually aren't correct. So I'm going to try and talk about some of these things. Um, and this may be a bit self-serving because it is my research area, but I think it is clear that the global financial crisis in 2008 really set off a whole um, an avalanche of social and political changes. Um, for one, even though the financial crisis was triggered by poor economics or, or bad economic policy, it actually meant led to the entrenchment of um, the neoliberal consensus around economic governance. And that's, that's a really kind of ironic outcome, if you think about it. Um, but because it led to that, that entrenchment of this kind of dominance, uh, what really happened is that across Europe, there was quite a lot of retrenchment of welfare state services. And there's a whole, there's a, there's a lot of consequences to that. And the one that I mentioned here in my slides is that as welfare states get smaller, it invites a kind of chauvinism around welfare state rights. So remember I said in the beginning that what Europe is, um, importantly, is an expansion of social and political um, and economic rights that actually, those are rights that are guaranteed by social services and by the state. So those are welfare state services. So when individual states start to pull away and start to um, shrink back um, or shrink investments in those areas, then there is an actual retrenchment of rights. And retrenchment of rights means that we feel that they're scarce, they're more valuable, and there's been an invitation, and we see this in fact in, in, in many uh, countries where we actually normally would feel that the welfare state was quite solid, a kind of encouragement of chauvinistic discourses where um, only particular kinds of people have rights to welfare state services. Um, for instance, in the Scandinavian countries where we normally think these are social democratic paradises, etc., cetera, um, there has in fact been a resurgence of anti-immigrant sentiment. And that anti-immigrant sentiment is likely fueled by this notion that welfare state resources are scarce and that only certain kinds of people are deserving of social and political rights. So I think that's a really important thing in things in terms of laying the context for right-wing activism, in particular to the extent that right-wing activism relies on a sense that um, certain people within a state are less deserving of support than others. It's also important to note um, the migration crisis, so that we, al we often date this as 2015, uh, 2015, but it probably has an earlier start date. This is in the literature very uh, called the migration crisis or the Schengen crisis or challenges to the notion of fortress Europe. Um, but I want to caution here that we should not make a link between migration crisis and in fact, any kind of increase in migration level, levels to the rise of right-wing activism. Um, we know from research, for instance, that in order for migration to become a political issue, it has to be made a political issue by an existing political party. It doesn't trigger, the, the very fact of migration does not trigger right-wing activism. It does lay it potentially could lay context and fodder. But here's an interesting 
example is that um, France, where there is a, a very powerful right-wing party that has an anti-immigrant state as an anti-migrant platform at the core of its platform, actually has a very small number of migrants entering into its country, uh, entering into, uh, across the borders on an annual basis. Um, so that's an example of how migration is a political issue without actually being an empirical issue. And so again, just to caution that this is part of the political, this is part of the discursive context maybe for the right-wing activism, but it's not part of the actual empirical context necessarily. Um, then I also want to mention that the more that certain that we get that there's electoral success associated with right-wing rhetoric, that it actually sets the tone for um, other for the success of other of other right-wing figures. So I want to just point out that there's a little bit of a feedback loop here, and that the more that um, we actually accept that there is um, a certain amount of right, a very far right rhetoric in mainstream politics, we actually um, allow for the growth of it. All right. Um, so what is the challenge that the far right poses to the European project, to European integration? Um, we saw in electoral politics, in the European Parliament elections that we can talk a little bit about uh, that just ended last month, um, we saw that, um, as we'll talk about in a second, there was a uh, complete hollowing out of the center. And even though the right wing didn't do as well as people were um, either predicting or fearing or hoping, depending on your perspective, um, it's clear that there are, have been significant changes in terms of electoral politics um, in the European context. I'd like to say, though, that the most important influence or the impact of the far right has not been in the electoral success of fringe parties, but it is in the mainstreaming of far right ideas in the regular in regular political parties. Um, and I think this is something that Edwin will talk a little bit about as well. Um, and this is a really interesting thing because um, at the same time that mainstream parties want to reject some of the really radical um, offensive things that are coming out of, of fringe parties, they are actually catering to what they understand to be part of their electoral base. So they draw on some of these ideas. Um, and some of the parties that we see, like the National Rally, which used to be the National Front, uh, Jopic in Hungary, the Italian League, and I'm sorry, there's a typo in my slides, it should be Salvini, or the Dutch Freedom Party. Um, these are now standard, they're mainstream conservative parties, they've sanitized the rhetoric, um, they have moved maybe slightly to the center. As they move to the center, we've seen, and there's a recent report um, in the EU actually on electoral politics that shows that as these parties become less fringe, then new parties have cropped up. We see this in England, for instance, with the English Defense League coming up. Um, so there appears to be political space. And by moving, when, we, when the mainstream parties take up these ideas, they simply create more political space for far-right ideas. And I think that this is really something of, of concern. And so I would say in conclusion that um, nativism, anti-immigration rhetoric, and, and in fact, your skepticism with a small caveat actually have contributed to the hollowing out of the center in European electoral politics. And the caveat here is that um, Euroscepticism is neither left or not a left or right phenomena, and Euroscepticism is not necessarily inconsistent with the European project. And so, but it's I think it's still important to identify that as a trend within some of these far right political parties. All right. So, what I see as uh, some of the really significant challenges is the resurgence of nativist and hypernationalist political rhetoric. Um, I think that, yes, we should identify this as coming from the far right, but we run a risk of not understanding the problem properly if we solely identify this in the right. It's also in mainstream politics, and it is also part of some left-wing movements. And this is, you know, and it's, it, I, I'm not going to, I don't want to make a causal argument here and saying that this has to do with the far right, but it's definitely true that as part of our, that this is now um, part and parcel of our political context that parties on both the left and the right are engaging 
with nativist and nationalism rhetoric in ways that actually legitimize it. And I think the other big challenge that we have to address is that mainstream governments, mainstream political parties that are in government right now are adopting policy measures which do show that they in fact feel politically that they are threatened by the far right. Um, we've seen rollbacks in Hungary, Austria, Italy, Poland of um, judiciary rights, education, media freedom, etc. Those are really significant um, aspects of civic and political citizenship. I don't think any of us would have thought that that would be part of the context that we'd be looking at right now, that in Europe we'd be looking at rollbacks of media freedom. But, though, but these are legislation that are being passed by governments that have been elected. Um, and I think that there is an argument to be made that they, are, they, that they are enacting these legislation due to the presence of some elected and also unelected far right actors. So my challenge to us is that let's not think about this as a challenge from the fringes. It's not. It's a challenge from the center. Um, sorry, I'm, government policies have made concessions to the far right. Far right rhetoric is a vehicle, it carries ideas that are challenges not just to the European project, which is, you know, my interest, but actually to liberal democracy itself. Um, and so one of the things I'd like us to think about is that, you know, why one of the reasons why we should be interested in protecting Europe is that it is a huge democratic organization system that fundamentally carries with it a lot of protections for citizens. I'd also, um, it would, um, I think it behooves us also to point out that hate crimes have risen. And so that with this kind of mainstreaming of rhetoric, it has created a space within our society that um, is allowing for an increase in violence. Um, we know that there's significant data showing that hate crimes have risen across Europe since 2012. Um, there was, I just note this um, as an example, that just did last month, Germany's government commissioner on anti-Semitism said, Jews don't wear the key in public because it's too dangerous. I mean, this is in 2019. I think that's a shocking thing. Um, there was a 2019 survey uh, from the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights and they, um, of Jews in Europe. They found that 89% of respondents said that racism was the most pressing problem faced by EU citizens. So these are, this I think is a direct um, implicate, or this is, this is something that flows directly out of the context that we're thinking about. Uh, all right, I'm just going to end here by uh, thinking about different ways in which we can kind of think through what all this means for us. Um, I think as Oliver said in the introduction, we really need to be thinking about the culture and social and political context that allows far right ideas to thrive. And I don't have a straight answer for that. Um, I can tell you that welfare state retrenchment that is accompanied by political and economic polarization is the exact breeding ground for far right ideas. And we've seen this historically. We don't have to look even very far, only 60 years. That's not that far back in history. Um, we also know that it creates, that it feeds into rhetoric of othering. And that kind of discourse of othering means that we feel that um, we feel less connected to the people around us and we feel less attached to them actually achieving or getting, getting rights because they're less deserving than we are. So I think as a general point I'd like to make for all of us is that when we're thinking about the political context, let's also think about economic polarization Let's think about citizenship. Let's think about ways in which we think about inclusivity. Um, and then just a couple of ways of thinking about what's next. Why should we be concerned about far right activism and Eurosceptic politics and the European project? Because some people would say there's really no link. Um, Euroscepticism, as I talked about before, maybe it's not linked to political ideology, but it's rather a belief and whether or not the European Union can deliver on policy priorities. And so it's not about being left or right. And so as an example here, 
I could, we could talk about some of the left-wing parties, like some of the social Democrat, social democratic parties, the socialist parties in Spain that are Eurosceptic, but within Europe kind of thing. Um, but I think that that's not really the challenge that we should be thinking about. I think that there is a strong link between far-right activism, Euroscepticism, and challenges to the European, to the European project. And that's because far-right rhetoric shores up and reinforces ethno-national political identities over the kind of civic identities that are supported by the European project. This lessens attachment to the idea of a European um, identity. In the best case scenario, that can happen alongside a notion that yes, there should be some multilateral governance. Um, there's a smaller role for the European Union, uh, but the border issue I think is a really significant issue for most activists inside Europe right now. And so I think that that's kind of a, um, uh, there's a, um, a dividing line there. But I think that the more likely outcome, the thing that we really need to think about is that the ideas that are being carried by these groups, by far right activists, that are being translated into policy that's enacted by elected governments, carry with them direct challenges to liberal democratic governance, to the idea of an educated and transnational civil service that can deliver on European policy, that can deliver on social, civil, and political rights. And so in that sense, far-right politics are, in fact, incompatible with the European project. All right, I'll end there. All right. Thank you very much, Helga. And I think it's, it's wonderful to hear uh, to put the rise of the extreme right into a broader context. And if we try to assess the impact they have on the ground in terms of politics, undermining some of the practices that we are used to in liberal and right-based democracy, um, I think it is worth seeing that you know the the impact goes far beyond electoral success, as you described. Um, it is it, it changes things on the ground. Um, Politically, far-right groups, even if they're not in government, um, have set the agenda. And they are, um, Helga, in your presentation, you speak about the hollowing out of, um, of liberal democracy, of representative democracy. And you know, in a, in a way, the rise of the extreme right is a reflection also of the relative weakness of other parties, in particular the, uh, the center-left, that haven't been able to provide a different kind of narrative to address certain issues like you know, the economic crisis and the influx of migrants and so forth. So um, your hypothesis that uh, the impact and the, the effects of the extreme right is, is going into the mainstream and has already, even if they're not in government, it has challenged what you describe as civic identity, civic practices in democracy, I think is, uh, is a very important point if you try to assess you know, what are we facing in terms of the, uh, the effects on the ground. Um, so with this, let me move to Dr. Edwin Hodge, um, who is a postdoctoral research fellow for the Borders and Globalization Project here again at the Center for Global Studies. And um, Ed has um, studied social movements from a theoretical perspective, uh, looked into gender theory, and comes from a political sociological perspective. And his research interests include, and you might not be surprised to hear, uh, given today's topic, right-wing and traditional social movement, extremism, and white supremacist activism in North American societies. And when, when Edwin now takes us into Canada more closely, you know, a country where you would say, you know, that's not really an important issue, you, know, you might be surprised to hear that countries are not immune uh, to the rise of the extreme rights in different ways. Um, and his presentation will partly be based also um, on, um, on his current project, research project, the Examination of Border Policies, Temporary Foreign Labor Force in Canada, and the Emergent of a Territorial Network of Far-Right Activism. Um, before I hand it over to, to Edwin, um, just those listening in, you can in increase the size of the PowerPoint presentation by pressing on this strange uh, um, symbol next to the st uh, stop sign there. So if you feel it's too small, you can do this. So with this, I would like to hand it over uh, to Edwin with um, his digital extremism, right-wing extremism, and recurrent re recruitment in online spaces. And with this, I'm going to mute my mic. All right. Thanks very much, Oliver. Uh, and thanks very much, Helga, for uh, for your talk earlier. A lot of what I'm going to say uh, dovetails rather nicely with, with Helga's research. Um, and 
although it'll, I'm moving into a slightly different context, a lot of what, uh, what Helga's research has shown um, is, is quite, uh, is quite a pro, uh, sort of apropos for, for what I'll be talking about as well. Um, so I'm going to talk primarily about how these far right movements and, and, and sort of particularly extremist and radicalized uh, right wing movements in North America, um, how they sort of have, have how their patterns of recruitment and patterns of activism have changed uh, since the advent of digital communications and the emergence of global communications networks. Um, and what I hope to, to sort of illustrate is that one of the most, uh, I guess, one of the most important, you know, from my perspective, one of the most important uh, developments in far right activism has in fact been the uh, internationalization of, uh, of group identity, of, of, of organizational or uh, movement identity. In other words, many of the ideologies, many of the sort of groups that we see now active in Canadian society aren't confined to Canadian society. They, they in fact, are uh, sort of emergent groups that come from a, an a-territorial sort of uh, international network. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I want to start you know, by telling a bit of a story from, um, from 20 years or 30 years ago. A lot of the, 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 the activism that we see, a lot of the ideology that um, sort of uh, is kind of located within these movements, it isn't new. Um, despite a lot of the new, the newer uh, bells and whistles, a lot of the newer uh, uh, symbols that we're going to talk about, a lot of the core ideological concerns are, are old. Um, so if we step back in time into the, the 90s and, and 80s prior to the internet, what we see is far right groups in North America, so Canada and the United States primarily, the way they they organized were, was through physical networks. That is, um, they had to meet face to face. They had to talk to each other with their mouths. Um, they had to sign up to um, physical mailing lists. Um, they would call, you know, 1-800-I-HATE-JEWS or, or whatever and listen to recordings um, of, of, you know, sort of racist ranting. Uh, in fact, one of my favorite things to talk about is uh, uh, back in the day, um, if you were a white supremacist in Canada, if you really didn't like Jewish people, you could call a toll-free number and hear a pre-recorded message telling you about how other people also hated Jewish folk. And then you would hear a beep and you could then talk for like five or 10 minutes into an answering machine talking about how you also hate Jewish people. And isn't it great that we all hate Jewish people together? Um, and I'm not too sure what people did with those recordings, but it really seemed to make people feel part of something, which was rather the point. Um, these sorts of movements were um, high maintenance. It was hard to get into because um, because you needed to physically find someone who was recruiting, or you need to needed to find pamphlets or paraphernalia addresses that you could uh, mail things to, or these phone numbers. Um, and once you joined, the risk for you was quite high because you uh, there was always the risk of being outed as as a Klansman, as a neo-Nazi as a white nationalist, um, because if you wanted to meet others like yourself, you had to go out into the physical world. So back in the day, um, recruitment brought people in, small groups of people, brought them into things like Klan marches, into, uh, they would bring them to cross burnings, which were um, semi-regular events within um, Klan subcultures. Um, if you were being brought into neo-Nazi groups, you were brought into, uh, you would often go to things like neo-pagan or heathen gatherings. You'd go to white supremacist bloats, which were like semi-spiritual get-togethers where you loved Odin and hated black people. Um, you could also go to right-wing uh, music concerts, um, often featuring um, variations on like white supremacist punk. Um, 
or you would buy bootlegged copies of of their music. Um, there was a Montreal-based uh, record company that uh, that uh, exclusively trafficked in uh, neo-Nazi heavy metal, uh, and it's it, it it has been on and off in terms of, the, of whether or not these sorts of of companies have survived. Most of the the old school ones have have since died out or or, or disappeared, but they didn't they didn't go extinct. They were simply replaced um, by online online distribution networks. These gatherings also made heavy use of very particular symbols and symbols that were recognizable as Nazi or recognizable as clan symbols. So, um, you know, folks rocking out with swastikas, right, or iron crosses, uh, the black sun, which is a, uh, it, it, it's sort of a stylized um, white uh, circle with some points sticking off on a black background and it's part of some older 19th and early 20th century conspiracy theory, uh, uh, sort of occultism. Uh, things like burning crosses and clan symbols. All of these were, were recognizable, not just for in-group members, but recognizable by law enforcement and by politicians. Um, they were recognized as explicitly white nationalist or white supremacist symbols. So it was very, very hard for white nationalists for uh, uh, far-right activists to inject their ideologies and inject their symbolism into mainstream discourse because everybody knew what they looked like. Everyone, no one was surprised. You know, if, if someone was wearing a, a red arm patch with a swastika, it's not really a it's not really a mystery what their ideology is. In the 1990s. Uh, the U.S. government and Canadian governments cracked down on far-right movements, um, and a lot of them went underground or just simply died out. Um, but with the advent of uh, digital technologies in the, the late 19th or late 20th and early 21st centuries, you had a whole new generation of people who were being introduced to these ideas, um, but now had access to a new medium to transmit that material. What you ended up seeing was groups of people who back in the day would have put on a white hood and gone hung out in the bush somewhere and burned a cross. Now those groups, those people didn't have to meet in public. They could meet online. And so what they began to do was construct these elaborate online communities that trafficked in signs and symbols, just like any other social movement or just like any other group does. But what they were able to do was construct new symbols for themselves, new uh, phrases, new idioms, new sort of code words um, to transmit information and to convey meaning to one another. What you ended up seeing was in the early 20th century, or sorry, early 21st century, you would see a slight decline in the number of real world uh, meetups and real world protests. So you would see in the early 2000s, for example, you, you might see um, a half dozen uh, members of Blood and, Blood and Honor, uh, which was a, a neo-Nazi uh, based group um, in Calgary and, uh, and Western Canada. You might see a half dozen of those, of those folks show up um, in Calgary in the downtown and try to protest um, and then be driven away by hundreds of counter protesters. So you would see those small clusters of activism, but as members of these groups sort of began to, to grow accustomed to online technologies and as their children grew up into this digital world, many of the of sort of the, the, the ringleaders of these movements realized they didn't have to go out in public as much anymore. Um, and during periods when right-wing activism of this sort was being pretty overtly tamped down by law enforcement, FBI, CSIS, the RCMP, this sort of thing, they simply retreated into online spaces. And in those online spaces, they were able to recruit and radicalize, often outside of, of anyone, sort of any uh, uh, prying eyes. Um, and more importantly, they could do it anonymously. Right? So it removed a lot of the stigma and a lot of the threat of discovery because you never knew who they were. I mean, if you're, you know, if, if, instead of it being like John Smith, from Calgary joining these groups, you are Winter Soldier 64. Um, you know, uh, it's harder to find out who you are. 
Um, so what you ended up seeing were these anonymous groups uh, trafficking in white supremacist and white nationalist rhetoric in what were, in a lot of cases, rather fringe spaces. So websites like Stormfront that had no overt connection to, to any mainstream sites um, or, or uh, Council of Conservative Citizens in the United States or the Occidental Observer, these sorts of things. But as digital technologies evolved, these explicit sites began to draw connections to mainstream conservative outlets. And that's where things get really dicey um, for, for trying to understand the spread of these kinds of movements. By the 2010s, and then up till now, neo-Nazi, white supremacist, or just sort of generic white nationalism, and generic extreme, sort of the radical right, their symbols bear vir virtually no resemblance to previous iterations of the symbols. They look often kind of goofy. For example, uh, if you look at the, 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 the slide that I've got here, that is nothing, right? What, it, what is that? Well, it's a badly drawn frog um, looking at what appear to be burned cookies. But that frog is a, is a new iteration of, of uh, the Pepe frog. Um, which uh, is a now has been appropriated as a as a, a symbol of the alt right, and those cookies are pretty unsubtle uh, stand-ins for Jewish folk. The the, the image on, uh, on its own is nothing, right? It, it's just it's just a, a a really bad drawing. When you attach the text to it, what you see is this is clearly a joke about the Holocaust. This kind of stuff is everywhere. It's ubiquitous online. Um, you know, I have in my own research and just in my own day to day life seen, pe you know, people as young as 12 with Pepe Frog, like Pepe avatars on their YouTube or Steam or Discord handles. And that's where this gets really frightening because in contemporary digital spaces, recruitment has never been easier. It's no longer a case of adults um, paying money to send out to a mailing list to receive some materials to go and, and dress up in a, in a robe and a hood and go burn a cross. It's now white supremacists stripping their, their language, stripping their rhetoric of explicitly racist terms and then taking that rhetoric and going into social media, going onto Facebook, Twitter, uh, going into YouTube going on to uh, Discord, and in, in the most troubling uh, cases, recruiting young people from video game lobbies, right? from Battlefield, Call of Duty, Fortnite, um, from uh, uh, the trade channels of uh, massive multiplayer online games like World of Warcraft. Um, you can go into the trade channels on these games and read and hear neo-Nazi and white supremacist ideology. So this is this is a, a new development that is really troubling and really really um, difficult to to track. Um, we can see the images, we can we can locate hot spots of activism and recruitment. But once those hot spots have been identified, and once they become sort of too public, they simply disappear and create a new one somewhere else. The symbols that they use, the the, the new symbols, the new way they package their material. Um, is often unrecognizable as extremist. It, it, it doesn't look extreme, or if it does, it can be passed off as a, as a joke, right? As a kind of what they call edgy humor, right? Um, they, the, the images can be spread, the, 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 the ideology, the, the, the language can be spread, um, across multiple platforms at no cost. I mean, if you've got an internet connection, access to free Wi-Fi, you can, you can engage in, you can spread these messages. And they can be cleverly hidden behind the sort of the, uh, the guise of being uh, jokey, being, being a joke, being edgy humor, being ironic or satire. Um, the problem, of course, is that if you're disseminating swastikas for real, 
or disseminating swastikas as a joke, you're still disseminating swastikas. And the, 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 the people who are seeing them can't really tell the difference. And that is sort of the genius of, of these movements strategies. They are making use of, um, of open networks and especially making use of networks under the guise of, of being advocates for freedom of speech, primarily the freedom to say uh, offensive and disturbing things. They're using that argument and using that cover to project extremist, uh, often white supremacist, but also anti-feminist and anti and misogynistic and xenophobic language. And they can project that out into, into, into digital networks that can be picked up and uh, uh, disseminated by others, or they can be used as the foundation of offline activism. Or, as we've seen in, 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 recent, uh, in recent years, this rhetoric can show up in mainstream political discourse. Now, this is Ron Paul, who, although he's something of like a, an old man shouting at clouds in, uh, in, in American politics, he's nevertheless influential uh, among a certain subset of, of, um, of, sort of political watchers and political junkies. He's a, an old school libertarian. Um, this is his official Twitter feed, and he is retweeting uh, an image uh, warning of the dangers of cultural Marxism. Cultural Marxism is just a recycled, uh, it's just a contemporary uh, um, uh, adaptation of an old Nazi term, cultural Bolshevism, which was uh, used during the Nazi era in Germany to label what the what the Nazis called degenerate art, which was basically any any art that they didn't like, um, and often the artists who were making it were then labeled as degenerate. So in this case. This is Ron Paul uh, tweeting out a, uh, a link to a Facebook page talking about the dangers of cultural Marxism. And if you look closely, you can see that those are some pretty obviously racist caricatures of world leaders, right? Um, the entire image comes out of white supremacist websites. Um, that's where it was being trafficked. That's where it was being traded. Um, nothing in here says you know, nothing here has any racial, uh, 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 any sort of uh, uh, racial slurs. Nothing about it is saying like, you know, the only, you know, white is right. Nothing like that. They're talking about cultural Marxism. Um, and here it is being being spread through through mainstream political networks. We also see this rhetoric show up in um, other offline spaces, primarily places like, um, so in Canada, uh, the Yellow Vest movement which is uh, uh, claims to be an anti-tax or a tax protest movement um, is is more rightly considered or more rightly seen as a, uh, a xenophobic anti-immigrant movement uh, that has some pretty disturbing connections to the to Maxime Bernier's um, was a People's Party of Canada and uh, some rather less overt uh, connections to the Conservative Party of Canada. Um, I think this is where I'll, I'll, I'll basically stop. I, I all I I'll sort of conclude by saying that um, these movements uh, are growing. Uh, virtually every watchdog organization that, that tracks these things um, it has concluded the same thing. They're growing. Their numbers are, are, are growing. What makes it so difficult uh, for people to, to counter or to, to identify is that they don't move through physical, they don't move through physical networks uh, that are, are sort of geographically linked. So when we are asking about, well, what kind of Canadian movements are there? Well, we can name a few, BC White Pride, uh, uh, Aryan Guard, Blood and Honor, Yellow Vest, or whatever, Sons of Odin. But those aren't uniquely Canadian, and they don't really emerge sort of from a grassroots Canadian space. They actually come from these dis sort of a -ter a -ter territorial um, sort of uh, digital spaces. Um, they adapt the rhetoric to the Canadian context, and then use that to create new social movements. Primarily, their, their recruitment remains online, however. Um, I realize it's kind of a, an unnatural place to stop, but here we are. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, so um, we can now move the chat box into, into our screen, where you know those who have now patiently listened will have a chance to, um, to formulate their questions, their observations, 
that is, you know, it's interesting. I be you you basically stop with the observation. We can speak about the social movement, right? Yeah, that uh, that spans not only national context but international one. Almost a kind of a paradox that you have a right wing nationalist international, you know, learning from each other and working across national borders along those kind of lines. But if you think about also um, the the hate speech legislation and attempts to ban hate speech, right? If what you describe is, you know, how can you actually legislate this? Think about Facebook, right? If it if it becomes such, you know, in, in these symbols, if it does no longer refer to the traditional racist. Um, ideology, right? It is more hidden, it is culturally coded, and so forth. So it makes it very hard to detect um, and to then also, in legal terms, um, to, to, to confront. Um, it's, uh, it's definitely a troubling development to see that, that also through the new media, they can main, be mainstreamed into and reach particular kids who probably don't really even know what they're looking at um, in this respect. Um, let, let me um, start looking at, you know, the first uh, questions are, uh, are coming in here. Um, from uh, Kevin Cremou, um, my question revolves around the spectrum of far-right parties around Europe and Canada. How expensive or varied are these parties? We see that many members of the Brexit party in the UK were opposed to Donald Trump's visit in the UK, even though both actors are usually categorized under the same far-right label. Is it dangerous to label all far-right parties together into one collective bundle, given that they usually target the same type of population and use similar strategies and propaganda to collect votes? Or is it more appropriate to analyze each right-wing party or an individual level looking at each case as a sort of exception to normal politics? You know, that's you know, where, how I started off our webinar today is, you know, what do we label as right-wing, right? And, and clearly, um, Adam, you know, you, you also included, you know, the, the Yellow West movement in Canada, which is a slightly different political animal from the one in, in France. Um, so where do we start and where do we end, right? You know, so sometimes we have a very good sense. Sometimes it's definitely a gray line. And maybe it speaks to the very fact that I think Helga underlined so vividly that the line between mainstream politics um, and the far right is being blurred. You know, we can no longer say, you know, it's very clearly identifiable in one particular uh, political spectrum, um, and you know, it becomes harder to identify them. I'm not sure who of you would like to take this uh, question. I'll get Evan. Um, Evan might want to add. I think it's a great question, actually, and um, it, 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 um, I think it really resonates with some of my concerns about even thinking about this as a as a as a right issue. Um, I. I wonder if rather than, so let me step back. First of all, I think that one of the really interesting things that's happened in politics, both in Canada and in Europe and in the US, is since, let's say, let's, you know, in the last 10 years, has been the erosion of traditional ideas of left and right. And that there are, we've seen that, I think, I think more um, sort of explicitly in some European politics where right-wing parties have taken up notions that are were formerly associated with left-wing parties as a way to, um, to, to win votes, et cetera. And more troubling to me is left-wing parties taking up discourse that's normally associated with right-wing parties, in particular anti-immigration stances, as a way of engaging with the base. So I think that one of what my first answer to your question is that I think we should actually engage with what we mean by right and left in politics, and it no longer means what we think it means. Um, for me, what poses the threat is not whether a party is on the right or on the left, but to the extent to which they engage with our notions of uh, dem democratic participation and civil and social political rights. So if we were going to label, think about studying groups together as, um, as a group, then rather than think left-right, let's think about um, do they pose threats to judiciary independence? Do they pose threats to, to media independence? Um, how, where do they stand on, um, on women's rights and rights of minorities and rights of sexual minorities? And those aren't any more left or right-wing issues, I think, frankly. So that, that's what I, but I think it's a, it's a really important question. Um, Ed, before I give it over to, to you, 
Um, let me add one thing to Helge. Um, many of you will have watched the recent uh, elections in Denmark. And there, the Social Democrats were successful. But interestingly enough, you know, they have a mix of policy prescriptions, essentially trying to marry um, the strong defense of the welfare state, you know, traditional strong you know, feature in, in Denmark, and very tough anti-immigrant uh, legislation. Um, so in, in a way, the moderate left, the Social Democrats, have adopted some of the um, the prescriptions and the, the anti-immigrant um, sentiments that the far right um, was quite successful in spreading and including to their program. So just more like a puzzle, right? How do we characterize this? Is this an in indirect effect that the far right had? Is this a uh, reckoning of the, of the moderate left? Of, you know, so maybe we didn't have it right on the immigration file. It's just an interesting reflection on where do you draw the line between left and right now? Do we have these clear categories of the left and right anymore in the 21st century? Or do we see a fundamental shift in, uh, in politics now where often those divisions and cleavages are more defined by maybe cultural issues uh, than socioeconomic or class issues, right? Yeah, so anyways, with this, Ed, do you want to? Yeah, um, I think that, uh, I think that, that, that Helga's argument is a good one. Um, if you take a look at at uh, uh, the, the kinds of, of parties, or, or forget official parties for a moment. Take a look at um, political affiliation among uh, uh, self-identified members of the alt-right or various ethno-nationalist groups. Um, in the United States and, and North America, you find a, a weird grab bag. Everything from like anarcho-capitalists and and what are called minarchists to to, to full-blown fascists um, to uh, Classical liberals, which um, I, 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 I I use quotations for because it's it's not at all clear that what they mean by that. Um, often, what I see as a sort of a it's less about clustering these groups according to to traditional political parties. Um, it is more, I think, more helpful. At least it has been for me to cluster them along uh, epistemological lines. Um, are they uh, are they philosophically opposed to 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 basic uh, as Helga pointed out basic sort of liberal traditions right um, there's a there's a sort of a, a movement sort of kicked around at the beginnings at sort of the start of, of what we now call the alt right called the dark enlightenment uh, which was seen as a conservative and traditionalist pushback against liberal sort of the liberal values the liberalizing values of the enlightenment. Right. The Enlightenment, at least in the in this narrative, was all about the expansion of democracy, the expansion of sort of state authority and state regulation over over uh, civil service or uh, public life and, and, and civic society. This sort of ideological movement rejects all of that and says, no, what we actually need are powerful leaders, right? Authoritarian. They want authoritarian leaders. So um, even if some folks in the UK are opposed to Donald Trump. A lot of the folks in North America are in favor of them. They are absolutely in favor of unregulated uh, um, capitalism, right? So uh, any attempt at state regulation, they are opposed to that. They tend to be anti-feminist, anti-women, anti-immigrant, right? They are, are um, uh, anti-multiculturalism. Uh, uh, they are anti-diversity. Uh, they tend to be... Um, they tend not to be particularly concerned with uh, issues of like LGBTQ uh, rights. Most of them are like, yeah, we don't really care. Um, but they are opposed to trans rights, which um, and indigenous rights as well. So they they do they are kind of selective in who they hate and who they want to deny rights to. Um, but yeah, this idea that we could can easily map them to traditional parties, I think, is 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 increasingly unhelpful. If if, if that makes sense. Um, Edgar, I think if you can continue on uh, with a question uh, that posed by Daviola Noja um, on the role of uh, public gatherings and festivals and music. I know that Daviola is doing a fascinating study on hard rock or, or a punk uh, neo-Nazi music scene. Uh, so, you know, you, you alluded to this, and it, it's an interesting mix, right? On the one hand, the digitalization of the far right, you know, the internet using it in creative ways but still being reliant to a certain degree on those real um, 
gatherings uh, where people come together and experience a, a sense of community. Yeah. Could you uh, talk about this, very probably from your Canadian? Sure. I, I have to point out one of the things, uh, just one of the sort of um, things I find amusing is uh, one of the reasons why white supremacist punk rock started uh, creating their own venues is because traditional punk rock despises Nazis, um, like actually hates fascists. Um, and so there would, when skinheads would show up to old school punk rock shows, they'd usually get the crap kicked out of them. Uh, so they had to leave and make their own, which I just think is hysterical. Um, but um, what these groups are useful for is these gatherings are great because as you say, it's one thing to have these sort of ephemeral, tenuous, transitory online relationships. It's another thing entirely to build affective relationships um, in, in, in physical space. Further, these spaces serve um, what some researchers have called uh, uh, free spaces for, for collective identity formation. That is, you can go to these spaces, go to a, 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 a Nazi or skinhead rock show or go to a festival or a bloat or whatever. And once there, within the borders of that, of that physical space, you can take part in, a, in sort of a, a, a common imaginary. You can imagine, you can envision your ideal world, right? What, what, your, what the world would look like if you were in charge. And within the bounds of that space, you can make that a reality. So people can adopt the patterns of gendered behavior that they are in favor of. A lot of these groups tend to be fairly traditionalist, so they can enforce traditional patterns of gender. They can enforce hierarchies based on in-group um, norms, that sort of thing. So these festivals are great because for a lot of the a lot of the, po the people who have constructed a narrative of themselves as being sort of persecuted minorities, right? Because as we all know in North America, white people are the real minorities, the real oppressed people, according to the the counter memorial of, of these groups, when they go to these spaces, they can act in ways that, m that bring them together and sort of recharge them for the, the work of doing physical activism. So these, these, m these music festivals, that, that's primarily what they were being used for. Also, they're great places to spread uh, Nazi merch. Like if you're you know, looking to sell your, your iron crosses, this is a good place for it. Thank you, Ed. Um, the next question addresses, in a way, Helga, what you described, you know, the, the deterioration of a civil or civilized discourse, you know, that is so fundamental to democratic practices. Walter Bell describes, you know, the expectation of anonymity and what it allows people to do on the Internet, you know, the spread of hatred, um, of, um, of, of, of false information, and all hidden behind the sense, you know, the anonymity of the internet. And uh, Rod asked, you know, whether um, anonymity prohibition of postings uh, or virtual presence um, without making yourself identifiable would be one way of addressing this. You know, so to in a way uh, force people to speak uh, with a real identity and thus take responsibility for what they actually do online. I'm not sure how to what degree this is enforceable, but it surely points to, to a, a critical issue uh, that we see now um, of, of people not really owning what they do on the internet and feeling in a way entirely free uh, from any constraints or moral expectations or even civilized behavior uh, in this respect. So any one of the two of you would like to uh, to address this? Uh, sure, Helga or... Yeah, I, I will have more to say on this than me, I think, because this is area of research. Um, I'll point, though, to um, some research that's looked at um, differences in interaction between uh, people online versus uh, people in person. Um, that's not anonymous. That is, you know, like the kind of interaction that we do on Facebook and, um, you know, whatever that actually requires you to have your name. It turns out that even when we put our names to stuff, when we engage in interactions online, we're a lot nastier. Um, so I would, I, I think, um, I, I think probably it's, you know, I, I, it's, it's not enforceable, but yes, it would probably tone down discourse to some extent to be, um, to, to have our names attached to opinions. 
But um, this is one of those areas where, I mean, this is kind of way out of out of my area of research, but I mean, you know, we've got, we've in, there's been this incredible leap forward in terms of communication technology and our norms and standards of behavior, and in fact, our cognitive and our psychological approaches to social interaction haven't kept up with it. So, and that's part of, I think, of what Ed has to deal with when he's reading the Reddit threads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. I, I. Yeah. People are people are mean online. That's uh, people are are are, are incredibly mean, uh, and people like to go out of their way to find out as much personal information about you as they can, so that they can be even meaner. Um, yeah. Uh, attaching attaching real names to to uh, to identity or to online identities. Uh, that can work in some spaces like Facebook, um, but it's really, really hard in a lot of the, um, I was going to say fringe, but they're not fringe. Websites like Reddit, websites like 4chan. Um, 4chan is, occupies a weird space online. It's generally recognized as a wretched hive of scum and villainy, but it's popular. It's immensely popular. And as a matter of policy, uh, you cannot have a username uh, to, to, to contribute to those spaces. Everyone is anonymous. And that's literally their username, anonymous. That's where online, if you see people calling each other anon, that's where that comes from. That's actually where that hacker collective, anonymous, that's where they come from. Surprise. Um, but yeah, even when we, even when we attach names, uh, like legit names, uh, that doesn't seem to, to stop people from being jerks, witness, the president of the United States or James Woods or half of the Baldwins. Uh, we know who they are. That hasn't stopped them from being assholes online. Sorry. I swear. No, no worries. We cut this out later. <laughs> um, and I think you can continue and, you know, you have a lot of um, uh, experience on the ground and, Maria Lacrona asked um, whether you can say something about the far right movement in various provinces in Canada. And my understanding is you have a lot of research on the ground in BC. You know, so maybe you could speak a little. Is there variation across um, uh, the uh, our provinces? Not really. The the primarily the the, the southern provinces are are equal opportunity haters. Um, BC and Alberta have. Uh, long histories with radicalized uh, racial racialist groups like um, the Christian identity movement, the creativity movement. Um, in the 70s, uh, the Ku Klux Klan in the U.S. Uh, tried to make inroads into Western Canada by flying potential recruits uh, from the from Canada down to their their rallies in the U.S. so that they could teach them how to start their own clavern um, up in Canada, and it didn't work so well. It turns out. The Klan isn't super popular here, but we we do have a lot of neo-Nazi groups and and sort of bog standard white nationalist groups. But then in Quebec we have groups like uh, um, the Sons of Odin who are kicking around there, uh, the Yellow Vests all through Ontario, uh, BC, Alberta. Um, the stereotype is to say that like oh yeah it's it's absolutely it's absolutely Alberta Alberta's the worst, but it that's actually not true. Um, in terms of virulent anti-Semitism, for example, that's BC. Uh, we have a long history of, of, of that particular brand of racism. Ontario has, has um, a lot of anti-immigrant um, and uh, some, some low-grade, low-key neo-Nazi stuff going on. Quebec has, has uh, neo-Nazis, has white nationalists. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I can't, really, I can't really draw a heat map for you of, of where the hotspots are. Everywhere, everywhere, except for like Nunavut and the Northwest Territories, they tend to have. All right, yeah, and one of the questions will be to what degree, you know, these sentiments spread by still marginal groups will spread into um, the rhetoric that it will inform, for example, our upcoming national elections, right? You know, so, Canada is often seen to be relatively immune to this right-wing rhetoric, um, white supremacist, nativist ideologies. 
But you know, sometimes uh, if I look at your research, Edwin, you know, I, I can get some doubts, but they are definitely very vocal minorities here. And to what degree they have an impact beyond their relatively still small communities. You know, that will you will see and, and that's you know, Helga, you alluded to this as well, how political discourse, you know, policy prescriptions are gradually being redefined by agenda setting right wing groups. Um, will be interesting to see co comparing North America now in our case, Canada and the European Union to what degree this really materializes here. Um, Jory Walsh here, who is uh, watching this you know, with some folks here at the Center for Global Studies, um, has a question from Alan, um, who asks, how well equipped are European public service agencies to identify and counter threats to maintenance of professional, nonpartisan civil service? So um, in a way to protect you know, the, uh, the professional no partisan civil services, state agencies, I suppose, you know, as meant here. Um, you know, I think uh, people like you, Edwin, sometimes you would need to go in there and, you know, to, to educate all, also all policymakers about the real threats because, you know, they're often not aware of, you know, where this is coming from. Aga, do you want to um, respond to this? Um, uh, public service agencies, you know, to what degree they're able to identify this? I'm not sure what this alludes to also anti-hate uh, speech legislation um, and, and so forth. So I'm not entirely sure what this focuses on, but uh, any comments? Sure, from I'll make a general Sylvia? comment, but um, it, this might be a question that you, Oliver, would also like to. This is in part of your research area as well. Um, my general comment is that um, there, the, the, the European Union invests quite a bit, um, quite a lot of resources, both in terms of capital and human capital. In, in educating its civil service and in educating others about the value of its civil service. I would say that, for instance, the whole Erasmus and Jean Monnet um, um, infrastructure around that is, is actually all intended to bolster and shore up and um, the, the European integration project to educating people on the value of the European project. So, so on the one hand, um, they're well equipped. But I'll just turn the question around and ask, is that what's needed to actually counter the threat that's in place? And um, coming back to, I think, the, one of the points that I made early on in, the present, in my presentation was that maybe this isn't so much of an issue about, uh, in terms of educating people um, about the value of a civil service or, or in fact, training a nonpartisan civil service, but about dealing with the factors in the context that are leading to the popularity of of the kind of political rhetoric that threatens Europe. So maybe um, in ha maybe a basic income policy would go farther in shoring up the European project than, um, than all of the Jean Monnet projects put together. <laughs> so I know that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you wanted to add to that. But. Yeah. Uh, but maybe I can add, add something to Hager, because there's also a strong argument being made from the critical liberal left to say, look, um, does it make sense to, to just, you know, say, you know, um, we need to educate those people um, who, you know, are vulnerable to this right-wing uh, rhetoric. And it often comes with an underlying uh, notion of, uh, of, uh, of superiority of the, the liberal um, elite in the country. So we have to be really careful here to say, oh, it's just a matter of telling people, educating them, you know, what to do and getting the, you know, basically getting these weird ideas out of their heads. So if you only see it as a kind of a cultural phenomenon, being, being misled, seduced by the internet, by these groups, I think it, it, it comes with a different policy prescription. But if you, um, if you follow, follow Helga's presentation, right, yeah, there are uh, severe changes in the socioeconomic environment in European countries, right? You know, the, the increase in uh, inequality, the, the relative decline in income in the lower sector of society. So there's some real grievances. And I think for the European project to be successful, it needs to address this. And I think it comes to a real, as a real surprise to the European Union to see that you know, when we went through the 1990s, it was all about we developed into a kind of post-national society in Europe under the uh, the guidance of the European Union. And now we see a resurgence of quite extreme and aggressive forms of nationalism. I think that has caught the European Union off guard and partly maybe because they have misidentified where this is coming from. Right? Yeah, that, 
some of the grievances are real. Um, the disillusionment with the moderate left of not having been able to respond to issues of austerity across Europe, you know, still high unemployment rates in, in southern Europe. So some real issues that mainstream politics hasn't been able to answer properly, right? And then oversimplified solutions like leaving the EU with a Brexit and so forth, they, they can be quite attractive if there is no other narrative, no other um, way forward to say how we should address those issues that are, you know, people face in the day-to-day -day lives. So um, that's, that's definitely a very good point. Um, Great, uh, Jody Walsh, uh, I, I get another question. Is there any link between the apparently increasing threat to democracy and globalization of the economic sphere? So that indirectly speaks to this. Um, the, the notion that in Europe often what these right-wing parties promise is as soon as we close our borders, you know, keep, you know, speak to ourselves, make our respective country great again, you know, they directly copy from Donald Trump, you know, um, the nationalist populace around uh, Europe, uh, we can address those forces of globalization that we, see, we deem to be, um, have a, a negative effect on our society. So, you know, the link between, you know, the, the development of our globalizing economy on the one hand and the, the kind of uh, nationalist backlash we see on the ground, you know, um, I'm not sure who wants to take uh, this. It's a big issue for sure. But it, it's, there seems to be uh, definitely a link in terms of the broader socioeconomic environment in which these right-wing movements flourish. If we can also leave this for another webinar at some stage um, <laughs> and, I, and move on. If there's no, if there, there, no, gonna, there's gonna, more. Um, maybe, yeah. Yeah, have, yeah, sorry, I'm I'm happy to. Um, Actually, the one thing that I wanted to bring in here, um, Ed is going to laugh at this because um, he's known me for quite some time, but when I see this question, I'd like, I think it's worth, it's worth remembering um, the work of a sociologist from the 1940s and 50s um, by the name of Thurgood Marshall, <laughs> who I wrote on citizenship. And, and he says some, you know, he says some really important things that are worthwhile remembering for us. And I think that this this question, this one, and actually Ben Ben's question, kind of underneath, which I get at it, is that um, we think somehow that we can engage with a conversation about democracy without engaging in a conversation about equality, and that somehow that it's that it's possible to envision a world where people can participate equally in the political sphere while being very unequal economically. And Marshall suggested to us way back in the 50s that if democracy was going to thrive, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but I mean, essentially, if democracy was going to survive, then there needed to be a way in which the state would protect its vulnerable citizens from the vagaries of capitalism, because capitalism itself was actually a threat to democratic participation. And I think, you know, this is still true. And it comes back to the comment about, you know, the threat to the European integration and, you know, are, are the agencies strong enough? Well, maybe we should be thinking about the root causes. And yes, globalization and the increasing number of people that have been left behind and the lack of sharing of wealth and all these things, I think that's worth talking about. Um, if I could, uh, if I could jump in as well, um, I wanted to, to, to sort of hitch, hitch this, uh, hitch this comment to what Helga just said. Um, I think it's important to point out that, uh, in Canada and the United States, and, and I'm, I'm unsure about the extent in Europe, but in Canada and the United States, civil service, it's not that they are unaware of these groups. They know about them. They've just chosen not to do anything about them. Right. I mean, we're talking about in the United States um, acts of Congress making it so that uh, so that the FBI's reports on right wing domestic terrorism are quashed. Right. That they're they're shut down so that they don't offend Republicans um, in Canada. We had the same thing. There were reports coming out that were indicating that in the previous government and carried on into this current government, um, right wing uh, extremism was being downplayed in, in terms of its importance in favor of spending time, energy, and resources looking at, um, at Islamic terrorism, looking at environmental activism, right? Um, seeking to uh, criminalize 
that kind of uh, activity. Remember, this is you know the RCMP. You've got you've got resurgent right wing groups all across Canada. And what do the law, what does Canadian law enforcement focus on? Anti pipeline protesters. Right. These are active choices being made. Um, and and that you know the even sort of ostensibly liberal governments are complicit in. The idea that, that Canada is somehow immune from this, it wasn't it wasn't seven years ago, it wasn't six years ago that the government of the day proposed a barbaric cultural practices hotline. That is straight up, that is right out of 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 far right nationalist playbooks, right? It's not like they were asking for us to rat out our deeply conservative Christian neighbors, right? They were making a point of targeting a specific group, an immigrant population, or at least an, uh, uh, an overtly othered population. So these practices, they're, they're part of sort of the everyday business of North American governments. Um, uh, in, in terms of uh, addressing the root causes, yeah, this seems to be really important. It's also important to remember that um, like someone else had, had mentioned, is this going to pop up in the next election? Well, these are, this is the culture war. This is the new, this is a new round in, in an old fight. The culture war of the 1980s, the left thought that they won. They thought, oh, well, we beat them, right? And nobody's, you know, all of our ideas are, are being adopted by the mainstream, but the culture warriors of the 80s didn't go away. They just went into abeyance and now the time is right for them to come back, and they are, and they're fighting again. These issues aren't, they transcend sort of political differences. This isn't about the economy. It's about status anxiety. It's about uh, fear of, of, of demographic changes. These are culture war issues. And so I think, uh, yeah, we have to address, you know, the, the intrinsic problems uh, that capitalism brings, right? Um, that inequality is baked into the system. But we also have to recognize that cultural issues that we may have thought dead were only sleeping Thank you very much. Um, I'm aware of time, so we have a couple of minutes left. We have two very different um, questions here. Maybe I, I read them out or, or address them and then we can go for a last round here with with the panel. Um, but Anne Hansen uh, asked First Nations may have lower rates of neo-Nazi style activity. However, these elements are certainly active on First Nations online Facebook fora with insidious efforts to equate First Nations colonial oppression and dishonor with Jews and science to influence quant regularly posted. So Ed, you, know, you might have an insight here. And, and then Roger Bell you know, addresses um, uh, in a way our, the, the discussion that we let, just left off. Uh, where to build the walls around the circles of sympathy? Uh, maybe the pessimistic conclusion is that the European project and the American dream or Canadian or Scandinavian one can only be feasible with restrictions of entry that amount to the denial of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the refusal to recognize equal claims of all humanity on the own, uh, common heritage of humankind. So that's what I what I just you know alluded to in very empirical terms. You know the Social Democrats saying you know we build. You know, to try to paraphrase this in Denmark, you know, we build a stronger sense of welfare, a stronger sense of solidarity and protection, but it involves stronger borders. And, you know, we, uh, in a way, you know, how we deal with the, the, um, the co commitment to fundamental human rights, the right to political asylum, you know, that might be compromised. And, you know, that is, uh, it's definitely a very difficult political question. Where does it leave us, right? Do we need a bounded world, you know, by nation state or the European context uh, to allow these fundamental um, civic rights that Marshall describes as well as the civic, the political, and the economic rights to flourish, right? Yeah, and then that uh, conundrum you know, might not be the most uplifting way to end our webinar, but you know, it, it clearly speaks to the power also of the radical right because they have this very simplistic solution, right? Close borders, get it, you know, send the immigrants out, and then we go back to the golden age. Uh, or we, we win our rights back and so forth. So I think it's, you know, as we know, things are far more complex, but you know, in terms of competitive electoral politics, the suggestion simply to close down borders, and that's why you know, the, the right wing, yeah, they love borders and you know, erecting those fences uh, against the other um, is so powerful. Um, any uh, of these two? Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll leave the, the question of, 
of, um, of the European project to, to, to help it because that's absolutely outside of my area. But um, I wanted to, to, to address the, the issue of um, uh, sort of rising anti-Semitism and, and nationalism in Indigenous communities. Um, the One of the things I find so interesting is that a lot of right-wing rhetoric, uh, say it not right-wing, let's say extremist rhetoric, bakes into its epistemology uh, a healthy dose of conspiracy theory, of conspiratorial thinking. So um, conspiracy becomes part of the foundation of how they build their worldview, right? So it, it doesn't surprise me to, to, to hear that, that um, in indigenous uh, dialogue, we see these sorts of elements, right? Uh, you know, colonial oppression as a, as a result of, of Jewish influence, that sort of thing. Um, the hatred of, of sort of um, groups like Jewish folk, that's not unique to white nationalists. Uh, Anti-Semitism is pretty much everywhere. Um, so it, it is not surprising that that kind of conspiratorial thinking would also crop up um, in discussions uh, uh, within indigenous communities because the same patterns of conspiratorial thinking and, the sim and similar patterns of anti-Semitism appear in African-American uh, uh, discourse around black oppression in the United States. I'm thinking primarily of like the I'd like to end on a much more hopeful note than, than Rob's question, <laughs> but, uh, but take that question as a starting point. Um, I know I don't believe that the only solution is to give in and to draw lines. Um, I think what, one way to, to, to put this forward is um, when, I, when I taught uh, social inequality, I've often asked students to consider, are you a Star Trek person or are you a Star Wars person? Um, Star Wars is, I mean, these are both, um, you know, projections of the future. Star Wars is dystopic. Star Trek is utopian. Um, what I like about the, the Star Trek metaphor is that the foundation is the notion of citizenship. I'm talking about the old Star Trek, not the new ones, so just to be clear. Um, the foundation of community is citizenship. Um, and um, there's, there's a lot to be said for thinking about citizenship in this context. Citizenship truly does not need to be a zero-sum concept. We make it a zero-sum concept and we try it to, to, to walls. Um, but the reason why we do that is because we started to, um, and probably in the 1980s, and I'm going to blame 1980s, 1990s, I'm going to blame New Labour, I'm going to blame the Clintons, um, and for that um, the kind of move to the right of progressive politics, we've conflated citizenship with rate paying. And when we do that, then automatically notions of inclusion become zero sum. So I would say on a hopeful note, the conversation that we need to have is actually about thinking about modes by which we are connected to one another when we, when we belong to a community without thinking about um, this as, as, as being as rate paying or as being zero sum. Thanks. Thank you very much, Helga. And I can only join those voices here in a chat box to thank you very much for a very engaging and passionate contribution to this important debate. You know, that unfortunately won't go away very quickly, but, but I think it is important to, uh, to be aware of the challenges involved, you know, the, the scope of the phenomenon of right-wing mobilization and what we can do as, in terms of trying to keep our civilized discourse, our um, our in inclusive sense of citizenship alive. So with this note and you know the positive reflection and or the hopeful reflection of Helga at the end, I would like to thank you and close this webinar and thank all of you online to have joined us today. Um, and uh, I hope to see you again on this webinar series in, in not too far distant future. So thank you very much.